executive director to give a quick talk about who we are and what we do. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Doug Trump, executive director of Urbanist, and I just wanted to first off let you know that we're recording the talk tonight, um, and that um, we'll have it up if you want to share it with anyone, and, and it should just be the speakers who are shown, but feel free to take yourself off video if you're concerned with that at all. Um, and we're just so thankful for Erica C. Barnett for joining us tonight. Um, Pat's just going to do a full introduction, but I, I will uh, say that she's been a really invaluable resource for, um, you know, getting the, you know, scoops and, and, and having the most up-to-date information and really, really solid coverage of a lot of topics, but especially lately police and homelessness, and they are such big topics. Um, and we really appreciate the sort of community that we have in urbanism in Seattle, and, and Erica is a big part of that. Um, and you know, trying to um, cover all these issues and connect it to urbanism, and have solidarity with you know people who are going through stuff and may not identify as urbanists, but trying to kind of um, you know make all the connections and be there for each other as part of the city. So um, that's what we're kind of doing here, and I and I think there's a lot of um, overlap, and I'm excited to hear more. Um, so um, the other thing I wanted to mention is just that if you are interested in getting more involved, um, feel free to reach out to me, uh, Doug, at the urbanist.org. Um, any number of ways, whether you're writing, uh, volunteering, um, you name it. So if you're curious, uh, drop me a line and I'll turn it back over to Patrick. Thanks, Doug. And then before we start, I just want to plug our December meetup. We're excited to be welcoming um, Representative Joe Fitzgibbons, who represents West Seattle. Um, he's been a uh, urbanist voice in the legislature and um, a strong voice on housing and transportation. Uh, and with that, I then want to turn it over to Erica C. Barnett, who is, as I'm sure you all know, one of the um, fine journalistic voices of our city. She has been a go-to source for coverage on um, homelessness, transportation, housing, um, one of the things I've appreciated is that she brings a um, empathetic view to people struggling in our city, in, especially in a climate where oftentimes they are demonized. Um, she has written for the Seattle Weekly, The Stranger, uh, Publicola, Erica, uh, The C is for Crank, and now again, happily at Publicola. She's also the author of Quitter, a memoir which I can hi highly recommend after having read it. And with that, I'll hand it off to Erica. Thank you. Okay, I have unmuted myself on all possible devices. Can everybody hear me? Awesome. Um, thanks for that introduction. Um, so I um, am a writer, I'm a reporter, um, I'm an urbanist, um, and I'm an advocate. And um, I have been doing journalism and writing about cities um, and, um, and politics since the late 90s. Um, and I've been in Seattle since about 2000 or since 2001. Um, and I spent a long time kind of in the trenches of alternative weekly newspapers of which there are none in Seattle anymore. Um, we still have The Stranger online. Um, and I was there for about seven years um, before my colleague Josh Fight and I left to start Publicola, which um, went through a lot of different iterations and eventually was bought by Seattle Met Magazine. Um, and I'm sort of going to give you a little bit of my of my bio that um, that does go into the, some of the stuff I cover in my book because it's it's relevant to the stuff that I write about now. Um, so in 2014, um, well before that, um, I uh, I developed a really um, and I apologize to anybody who doesn't know this is coming. This is just what my book is about. So you know, strap in. <laughs> so I I developed a drinking problem. I got really heavily addicted to alcohol, and I got fired from my job. And um, I you know I know I'm smiling about it now because things turned out okay. But um, it was a really really rocky road. And, um, you know, and at the time it kind of felt like this is the worst thing that has ever happened to me. And I really went off the rails for a while. And um, eventually, you know, while, while I was sort of getting my life back together, which took a while, um, I did eventually get sober and that's what my book is about. It's called Quitter because it's about um, the, you know, the kind of struggles I had and how many times I quit before I actually did um, finally quit drinking in um, early 2015. Um, 
And um, so anyway, while that was going on, Public Cola sort of shut down and, um, and it was really, you know, it was really tragic. And um, I think, you know, at a certain point um, when my brain was clear and I was kind of pulling myself together, I, I decided that, you know, I realized I'd gotten through the worst thing that I think uh, most people can imagine getting through, which is, you know, a deadly disease that almost killed me. And, um, and I think I realized at that point that, you know, where I thought my work was my life and my life was my work, that wasn't really true. And, and in fact, I could do anything I wanted with my life. So what I decided to do is um, I started this website, which at the time was called The C is for Crank, and, um, and built it up and just covered the things that I wanted to cover. And the things I wanted to cover um, were things that I cared about. Um, and those included, you know, people who I, who I realized were a lot more like me than they were different. So um, people with addiction, people who are homeless, people who are, you know, I, I mean, heroin users. Um, I, I've written a lot about um, safe injection sites um, and housing. And I think these, all these issues are actually very much tied into urbanism um, because, um, I mean, as all of you on this call undoubtedly know, I mean, we can't solve the homelessness crisis without solving the housing crisis. And, um, and I think we also can't solve the homelessness crisis um, without solving the addiction crisis. But um, those are kind of the things that I chose to write about. And, um, you know, I'm not a dispassionate observer of these issues. I'm a participant. Um, I have... Um, and empathy that I didn't, Patrick men mentioned empathy, and this is not to like say that I'm some kind of great person, but when you go through something like that, um, you know, you, you just start to care about issues in a different way. And so, um, you know, so now all the things that I found interesting before, like gentrification, politics, land use, um, you know, urbanization, homelessness, um, I, I just gave up on the idea that I needed to be objective in any way about these issues. And, you know, and I really, you know, have kind of embraced this idea that it's my job to have a bias for, uh, for people who, you know, the rest of uh, society and a lot of times, you know, the Seattle Times and uh, elected leaders kind of shit on. And, um, and that, that my bias was in favor of listening to them and being empathetic with them. Because one of the things that I really realized, and I think a lot of us are going through this, this kind of journey right now of recognizing our privilege and recognizing, you know, our racism and, um, you know, and just all the things that kind of go unquestioned. One thing I really realized was I got sober and I was able to get my life back together and start a company and I'm successful now and I do it as my full-time job because of this massive amount of privilege that I have. And I meet people who are homeless all the time and they don't want to be homeless. I've never met, as, as council member Shama Sawant says all the time, I've never met anyone who decided one day to be homeless and wants to stay that way. Um, I just, you know, I had privilege and I had a home. I had health. I'd never went without health insurance. Um, I almost got evicted, but I didn't because, you know, my family was there to loan me some money. Um, and so I think that there's just, there's a lot of stuff that I didn't realize before I, you know, was kind of at my lowest point about, um, how hard it is to get out of homelessness in particular. Just, it's, it's really, really hard. And I think that when we start from a, a position of, from that position and from putting ourselves in th that person's shoes, um, we don't reach solutions like let's sweep the tents from place to place. Um, we don't reach solutions like, you know, let's throw people in jail for trespassing if they're in the wrong place. And, um, and so, um, I guess, you know, my horror at some of these policies that we've considered and that we've done um, is, is very much reflected in my writing. That's my bias. And it's, you know, it's what I'm really passionate about. So, um, you know, even when I'm covering, I mean, most, most of what I cover, if you follow my blog, I mean, a lot of it is, you know, pretty dry budget stuff. Like, here's what's happening with $30 million in the budget. And here's, you know, here's how the council and mayor are going at it. But it's really, um, ultimately, it's about trying to... Um, trying to make sure that the least are helped first um, and, um, and promoting that point of view um, and, and, you know, and not pretending that I'm just passionate because I, you know, to some small extent know what it's like and I know how hard it was for me. So, um, you know, with that, um, I hope that wasn't too much of a bummer <laughs> by way of an introduction, but I, um, I would love to talk about whatever y'all want to talk about, um, the budget, homelessness, um, the navigation team, whatever. Um, I just watched a, uh, an epic like seven hour hearing today. So, uh, I have all the budget numbers kind of like right in my brain, but, um, yeah, happy to talk about, um, whatever y'all are interested in. So thanks.
Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask a couple broad questions. And then if people have questions they would like to ask, please throw them in the chat and we will get to them, um, hopefully. Um, this is a little off the urbanist topic, but um, journalism is very important to making a city work and account providing accountability. And um, like, as you mentioned, The Stranger and the Seattle Weekly are sort of the PI, the shadows of themselves. Um, how is it as an independent journalist um, in the city? Um, and I know you can, this is a good opportunity too, if you want to plug your Patreon or. Uh, oh yeah, <laughs> you yeah. can go. So my site is publicola.com. So I did get public, that's, that's kind of the other happy coda is eventually what was crazy, we couldn't get publicola back forever. And then just one day out of the blue, like two months ago, they contacted us and we got it back. So it's publicola.com slash support if you want to support me. Um, you know, it's, um, I, I kind of think what I do is not super replicable in like, you know, you couldn't like take my model and put it in every other city. So I think that's, you know, the fact that, that everybody's struggling so much and that local newspapers are going away. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's heartbreaking. I mean, I worked for the weekly for, um, for two years. I worked for the stranger for almost seven years. Um, the paper I worked for in Austin um, before I came here is a shadow of its former self. Um, so as an independent, I mean, you know, it's, um, it's, it's scary, you know, it is scary because it's, um, you know, I depend entirely on donors. And so if they turn on me, you know, or, or if the economy goes to crap, you know, and people can't, you know, afford to give, which I totally understand, I've given up subscriptions, you know, at times, um, you know, that's, I mean, that's it. So it's, it's very precarious. And I feel very much like, um, you know, each of us who's out here, and there's, there's certainly other independent journalists um, in, in Seattle, which is great. But we're all kind of like these little islands, and we all have our own little business models. And it's not like it used to be where you have these, um, these massively, massively ad funded um, institutions like the Seattle Times and like the stranger used to be. I mean, you know, it stranger used to be like a 160 page, you know, weekly newspaper. And, uh, and now it's, you know, it's a blog. And um, yeah, it's, it's a little bit scary. But it's, it's exciting, too, because I don't have to, I don't have a boss, I don't have to go to meetings, which is like the worst thing about having a job. Thanks. Um, what do you see to the, the is the barriers to police accountability? I know you recently um, brought on a, another reporter to cover specifically police accountability police reform and accountability. And where do you see the trajectory of that movement in Seattle? Yeah, I think the biggest barrier is, um, is the police union. Um, the fact that, you know, unions have, uh, you know, or police unions have a tremendous amount of power, even though they aren't really unions in a traditional sense. Um, you know, I mean, the, there, was a, there was a pretty good accountability ordinance adopted in, um, in 2000. Um, 17. If I'm wrong, it was 2018, but I think it was 2017. And then in the contract the next year, you know, they just kind of like tore it up and, and didn't implement a lot of the reforms. And, um, and then the council voted for it because, you know, they felt like they didn't really have a choice. And, um, and so, so it's really hard. I mean, I, I don't know, I don't know if, um, what I'm looking at right now, like in terms of, um, cutting the size of the police force is um, is whether that whether what's really going to happen is they're just going to let it kind of shrink through attrition which is not the same thing as police accountability right I mean if you're just kind of getting rid of people at random as they quit and not replacing them um, and then saying oh we cut the size of the police force which is you know to some extent what the council is doing this year you know that's that's not good either um, so it feels a little haphazard right now and, um, and I think the union is, is a big, big reason why, because they're renegotiating that contract. It's all going to happen in secret. And uh, yeah, we don't know. We're not going to know what it looks like until it comes out the other end. Thanks. Um, homelessness is clearly one of the biggest issues in Seattle, whether you are someone like, I think, by most of us here who view it as a humanitarian crisis and a responsibility of our city to take care of our most vulnerable, or if you like many people view it as a as bad people who've come from away. Do you, or like do you, just an aesthetic problem. Yeah, or just an aesthetic problem, exactly. Um, do you feel like the city is making progress? Um, and are, are we, we losing ground? Are we gaining ground? Are we making progress? Is there, is there hope going forward? Is there hope? I mean, yeah, it feels, I mean, it can feel really, 
Um, I mean, if you just go outside downtown in South Lake Union, you know, in Soto, uh, the Denny Park, I mean, what's happened because of COVID is that the homelessness that was already there is just really visible now. And, and so it can feel like it's getting a lot worse. Um, I don't have the numbers to know um, how much worse it is, um, but it makes you know intuitive sense that um, an economic recession is not going to make uh, fewer people homeless. Um, I do think there are, um, there are some signs of progress. I think getting rid of the navigation team, which removed encampments primarily in the last couple of years, um, is a really important first step. Um, and I think, giving some of that work over what the council is sort of doing right now is um, is handing more work over to the outreach providers who already know how to do that work. Um, and so I think there's like a need, I think there's a needle they can thread where more people are able to get housed. But, um, but the fact is we still have a housing crisis. The city is bringing 650, I think, um, units of permanent supportive housing online in the next two years. And that's not nearly enough. Um, we have all these, uh, we have federal grants, but those run out, um, I think next November for the most part for housing. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's hard, it's hard to be like optimistic and on a macro scale. Um, and I also think that, um, there's a lot of, I mean, there's just more and more pushback. There was a poll from that the downtown Seattle association did that just said, you know, people are just fed up with having to look at this stuff. Um, but at the same time, you know, I think the council and mayor are actually talking now and they're actually like working on compromise positions that aren't just, you know, well, we got to get rid of this in camera because, you know, X number of people in Wallingford complained about it or whatever. So I am, I'm somewhat optimistic, but that's tempered by like just everything we see around us. I mean, the economy is not, is not heading in the right direction yet. Um, and, and we're not spending nearly enough money on housing. Thanks. Um, here's, a, here's a kind of a random question. What's your tips for people who've never filed public disclosure requests before? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. I know a um, lot of us are poking around. Well, if you're filing it like through a system, um, like an online system, don't worry about wording it. Like, you know, I'm requesting this under RCW, blah, 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 because they have to answer you no matter what. Um, but the main thing I would do is just be as narrow, narrow, narrow as possible. If you know what you think you're looking for, um, really tailor it so you're clearly asking for that document. But um, if you don't know what you're looking for, keep it as narrow as you can. Like, so by narrow, I mean, you know, have a set of dates, like have a date range. Don't just say all document, all correspondence between, you know, Mayor Jenny Durkin and Council Member Shama Sawant. Um, because that's going to take them so long that, you know, either they're going to reject it as, as overbroad or it's just going to take them forever. Um, and, um, and narrow it just in terms of, well, actually two things. So narrow it, but also make it broad. So narrow it in terms of what you're, what you're actually hoping to find and tailor your language um, so that, you know, so that it'll include that and it won't include like an entire a person's entire email inbox because that's you're never going to get that but broaden it um, in the sense that um, if you're asking for correspondence sometimes what I do now is I ask um, really specifically for different kinds of correspondence because if you just say emails you're going to get emails if you say correspondence you'll get whatever they decide correspondence means and so um, so you might want to ask for um, you know direct messages on social uh, on social media sites and whatsapp messages I've never gotten a whatsapp message but like you know, or signal messages, which you also won't get, but you should let them know that you're looking for that stuff. Text messages um, are often uh, a treasure trove. So just, you know, list every kind of, every kind of document you're looking for, but narrow it so that a reasonable person who's like sitting in a public records office and has a million of these requests could actually respond. Because I mean, honestly, like if you, even if you get what you want um, in a pot, in a huge pile of documents, if it's six months later, it might not matter anymore. So, um, so you want to make their job, you know, relatively easy um, without, you know, without diminishing your request. Thanks. Well, while we're on some journal, some more journalistic questions, um, there's a couple questions in the chat. What's your take on journalism seeming seemingly exorable march towards the world of nonprofits? And do you see a path to accountability and advocacy journalism to emerge through a public private model like the BBC? I think that's where it feels like that's where we're going now. I am a I'm a for profit. I'm not a nonprofit, um, mostly because I don't like paperwork. 
but um, but I think um, I think a public private model is I mean I that's that would be the ultimate you know kind of dream because you know you actually have some sustainability built into that model I mean being a nonprofit is not a um, is not a solution in itself it's just um, it's just a way of setting up your business. Um, people do tend to like to give to 501c3 nonprofits because they can get their, um, they can deduct it on their taxes. Um, but, you know, if you're talking about like $5 donations per month or, you know, if you're asking for $500 a year or whatever, I don't know that it makes that much difference, um, except, you know, some people psychologically prefer um, nonprofits more. And you can get grants and things like that that aren't, that I'm not eligible for as a for profit. Um, but I think, you know, ideally, I mean, in the dream world where we live in a utopia that cares about journalism, which is not the world we live in in America right now, um, there would be government funding and the government um, would see a value in having journalists um, hold, hold people accountable. But, you know, I don't think we're headed in that direction anytime soon. Excellent. Um, so you, you said you just came from the budget hearings. Um, what do you see coming strongly out of coming out of the budget um, as a city council priorities and getting getting expanded or supported or what do you, what do you see in the budget these days? Um, well, one thing they're doing, I mean, it's so much of the of the changes that they've made have been to sort of reverse um, this this notion this idea that the mayor had to spend a hundred million dollars. Um, on to be determined, um, you know, expenditures in BIPOC communities that would be just decided by a task force that she would appoint. Um, and so, so the kind of big movement right now is that the city council is walking back all of that. And so they've taken, they've essentially clawed back $70 million of that hundred million. So that is going to equitable um, strategic investments um, in um, communities with the high risk of gentrification. Um, that was already supposed to happen, so that's not particularly exciting. Um, there's a there's a lot of money going into this participatory budgeting process, which is still, you know, kind of it's a little vague as to what exactly that's going to look like because it's still shaping up. Um, they're doing the there's a contract out for um, King County Equity now and decriminalize Seattle to do um, a bunch of research that's happening through the rest of this year, um, and then next year hopefully we'll start to see what that process is really going to look like and how, you know, community and just regular people are going to be able to contribute to the, to the, the actual budget. And I think that's where the rubber is going to meet the road. I mean, a lot of times participatory budgeting just means like, you know, you go on a website and you play with some sliders, you know, do you care about trees? Do you care about homeless people? Do you care about, you know, preventing, you know, apartments in your neighborhood, like whatever it may be. Um, and then, the city takes that and they they nod and they do what they were going to do anyway you know so um i mean I, i'm i'm cynical uh, about these processes a little bit because i've been you know doing this for a long time but i mean there is you know a lot of money going into this for the first time and the council and i think the mayor now too are really dedicated to figuring out how to make it work so um that could be a really big um change next year um, what else? I mean, they got rid of the navigation team ostensibly, um, which is, which is a really big deal, even though it's not a huge amount of money. Um, the, um, police department, they've abrogated a bunch of positions so that, um, you know, essentially the police department can't hire back a bunch of officers once they have more money. And, uh, and so that's, that's a big deal. But again, I think right now they're cutting through attrition rather than doing it really systematically. Um, they're talking about doing out of order layoffs of like the of the cops that have sustained uh, complaints against them. Um, that again has to go through the contracting process, and you know we'll see. Or the, sorry, the um, not the contracting process, the um, the union contract process, and so we'll see how that uh, how that plays out. So um, yeah, it's you know it's kind of it's not the most exciting budget year, despite the veto battle earlier this year, because I think everybody's kind of coming to to terms with this recession era budget budget and it's not great but it's not as bad as they thought it was going to be so there's I mean a lot of it really is status quo with some you know with some big changes that'll have impacts next year on uh, on public safety and homelessness. Do you, do you think coming out of and if we if we meet again this time next year and look back do you think that any of the goals of the Black Lives Matter movement will have been met in the city of Seattle or do you think 
and what I've seen with the budget so far, much, most of the police money that's being defunded is just shifted to a different department, which I guess is good in and of itself, but it's, I don't know if it really meets the, the dream of activists on the street. Yeah, I mean, I think that people who want 50% cuts to the police budget are going to be disappointed at this time next year, too, when we'll be talking about next year's budget. Um, the proposal this year essentially cuts 20%. Um, and, and it's not, you know, it's not what I would call hard cuts. Um, the council and the mayor have avoided making those hard cuts. And, um, and I understand why. I mean, they don't really have to because police are leaving and, um, and it's it's easy to just say, well, we just won't won't replace them. Um, so I think that that I think that people will be disappointed in the just the total number of cuts to the uh, the actual police force. Um, and then the rest, I you know, I think it just depends on what these other investments end up producing. A lot of money is going into the human services department to um, do things like um, you know mental health counseling, and you know the fire department is getting a crisis counselor. So there's there's little shifts that are happening, but it's not. It's not like a radical, um, you know, reimagining of public safety. And and same thing with homelessness. I mean, you know, Tammy Morales, city council member, um, gave a speech, I think, yesterday about the fact that, you know, this time next year, we're going to still see a huge homelessness crisis. Like, we are not, even with all this money that's coming in from the feds, it's not going to solve things. And so, um, you know, I think that's a reflection of the fact that budgets are incremental and it's really hard to push through radical change um, for all sorts of reasons. Um, I think they're trying, but you know, I think that they're not, they're still not going to be trying hard enough or fast enough for people who, you know, really wanted, you know, dramatic change yesterday. Thanks. Um, while we're on the topic, someone sent this question in earlier. Um, SPD has made a ton of arrests during the BLM protests. Do you have any idea of how many were charged or not, or how many protesters were injured during the arrests or car, car windows broken or cars impounded? That would be a great question for my reporter if he was here. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I sort of outsourced some of those specifics to, um, to my reporter, Paul Kiefer. So I'm not going to hazard a guess. Sorry. Fair, fair enough. Fair enough. Um, well, while we were on, uh, coming back to the city council and the mayor, there's been quite the back and forth with the city council basically overriding the mayor's veto earlier and undoing a lot of um, her budget. What I, can you talk a little bit about that power dynamic and what you expect in the coming election? And if they, you think, will the mayor run again? Mm -hmm. Will, will that's so funny. I was just, step up? yeah, I was just talking to one of her advisors about that. And, you know, I mean, the answer is who knows? Um, I, the, the dynamic really, I mean, it's interesting. I don't know what happened between, I, I just, cause I wasn't privy um, between August when, you know, the mayor and the council were just absolutely at each other's throats. And now when, um, when the mayor has essentially said um, that she accepts all of these budget cuts that the council is making, I mean, she made the statement that was incredibly conciliatory yesterday that was like, um, you know, I'm, I'm glad that they're still investing this $100 million or just doing it through slightly different community led processes or something. Um, and that was just such a change in tone that um, then what we had seen before. And I don't know if that is the, uh, uh, like an artifact of her kind of getting her way on the police cuts because there weren't these radical, you know, or, I mean, I keep saying radical and I don't mean that in a negative way, but there weren't these, you know, these large cuts to the police department that, um, that the mayor had been worried the council would make, right? So she kind of got her way on that issue. And maybe that's, you know, allowed her to see her way to, to being fine with the council um, decimating her hundred million dollars. Um, although it was interesting, I talked to, uh, I was at a press conference with the mayor this morning and I asked her about that. And she said, um, she was like, well, you know, I'm really glad that the council has come around in my way of thinking and they're going to allocate this hundred million dollars. Um, meaning like they, they're spending it on all these other things that do benefit black indigenous and people of color communities. Uh, but that's what they were going to do all along. And the mayor's office previously said that you know, that, that the way they were planning to spend it was inappropriate. So, you know, I, I think everybody has just decided that they need to get along um, and we can't have another replay of, uh, of August because that was just awful for everybody involved. And, um, and that's what they're doing now. But as far as next year's election, man, I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> it's, I mean, truly like, and nobody, nobody I talked to um, really knows either. So, um, 
you know, I'm sure if you ask the mayor herself, she would say she hasn't decided yet, but she's not raising money right now. She hasn't raised a ton of money yet, but you know, as we've seen in the past, she can raise a lot of money really fast when she, when she needs to. Interesting. Um, I was gonna ask, do you think, do you think if she chose to run, she would win? And it's, in, it's interesting, like, where is the politics of Seattle blowing right now? And well, there, so there, tell. yeah, I mentioned earlier that there was a downtown Seattle association poll and, you know, the poll was a little bit, I, yeah, I read the questions. I felt they were slanted um, in a certain direction, <laughs> um, in a, you know, in a, in a more sort of law and order direction. Um, however, um, you know, the council's approval rating is very low. The mayor's approval rating is not great, but um, it's, I mean, it's interesting. It's, it's, it's somehow easier for me to see her not running than running. But if she does run again, just because I, I it feels like she doesn't always enjoy the job particularly. Um, but if she does run again, I don't know. It depends on who runs against her. If it's Lorena Gonzalez, I think she could potentially beat her. Um, if it's, um, you know, somebody who's further to the left, you know, I think there is a bit of a backlash happening right now in part because of all these homeless encampments that are now visible and because of, you know, a sort of, um, backlash against protesters, um, among, among certain, uh, parts of Seattle. So, um, you know, I mean, Durkin has always been more popular than I think like lefties, uh, like me and people to the left of me, you know, can, can really perceive. Um, but, uh, especially among like the people that vote a lot. Um, and so, uh, it's an off year election, you know, I mean, it just, there's so many factors, but I think she could win again for sure. Uh, jumping back to homelessness. I, I, I think that discussion just made me think about the, Perception I, I get is that cities outside of Seattle and people in the suburbs just think we're an anarchist jurisdiction overrun with crime and homelessness, regardless of the reality on the ground. Um, but yeah, we joined up with it to the regional to regional response to homelessness, um, and then we recently saw many cities decide to preemptively tax themselves to avoid paying into a regional tax to help fund homelessness. Um, can you talk a little bit about the, the regional authority that had such great promise and if it's doing anything or has hope <laughs> in the future of doing anything? I mean, it's like, so right now, I think I just got an update and I didn't, I didn't check um, to see what, what the latest is, but um, right now they're trying to hire somebody, a CEO who was supposed to be hired, um, in, I think in September. And now the latest prediction is January or February and maybe even later. So, so then, you know, you have to get that person up to speed. You have to hire staff, you have to do all this stuff. So you're looking at middle of next year before the authority really gets up and running. And then, you know, and then you have like, you have all these, I mean, yes, you have suburban cities who are like, screw that. I don't want to pay for, you know, for a, any kind of homelessness solution that, um, that I don't get to, that they, you know, I mean, their objection is essentially A, the money won't necessarily be spent in their cities and B, that they won't get to decide who, how it's spent. And so, um, you know, those are, those are, you know, I guess valid objections, but, um, but I also think that, you know, we can't let ourselves off the hook, those of us who are in Seattle, because Seattle too has been resistant to giving up certain parts of their own homelessness response, um, witness the navigation team. And, you know, why is that in, why is that work even in the city of Seattle? I have no idea. I mean, I think it's because the city of Seattle wants it. And so this sort of jockeying for power and position, it's not gonna go away just because you form this regional authority because you still have, I mean, the regional authority has tons of suburban cities represented in it. They have a lot of power. We're gonna disagree with them um, about what kind of spending needs to be done. City of Seattle is gonna be tempted to try to claw back some of that money so that we can spend it how we want. Um, so, you know, I think there's a lot of, um, there's this, there's this theme in Seattle and in this region of like thinking that if we just make a big enough table, um, then all our problems will be magically solved. And I think this is a good example of making a big table and um, maybe not thinking through all the challenges that are gonna be you know, inherent at that table when you've got you know, the city of uh, Renton you know, saying, suing because they don't want the homeless people living in the Red Lion Hotel downtown 
and, uh, and the city of Seattle saying, we need to control the navigation team because we know best how to do that. Um, and, and on and on and on. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I think we won't have any idea really until next year, middle of next year at the, at the soonest. And meanwhile, the city of Seattle is, by the way, losing people left and right in their homelessness division, which is, you know, down to about half the size that it used to be, um, which is a story that, you know, except for, except for me, nobody has, is reporting on. And maybe it's, maybe it's too in the weeds, but it's a really big problem because they're still having to run all these contracts and still having to, you know, essentially service the homeless agency or the homelessness um, government body for the region. And, uh, you know, in the absence of this regional body and like they're just I mean attrition is just like people out the door left and right you know every week and they're not rehiring people do you do you know why that is or what's going on well because people don't know if they're gonna have a job I mean they're not guaranteed oh. jobs at the regional authority so it's like and they and they've had this layoff date that has just kind of migrated 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 as the timeline for the regional body has migrated so um, so yeah I mean wouldn't you I mean if they get another mm -hmm. job they're gonna take it so um, I think that's that's like a bad side effect of take, letting it kind of drag on and on and on, is that you just you lose people and you lose institutional knowledge. I might just want to throw out there if I can keep asking questions from my little secret list, but if other people have questions they'd like to throw in the chat, we we have time to get to them. So I would encourage encourage it. Uh -huh. People are saying subscribe to the South Seattle Emerald. Absolutely second that. Um, there's also Converge Media. Um, I don't know if anybody in the chat mentioned uh, mentioned them, but that's another great indie, um, uh, I was going to say publication. Uh, what are they? Indie media <laughs> company to support. Uh, do you, in the, the root of homelessness, in Seattle, it seems like it's just the affordability issue. It's just that the city has become so expensive. Um, what do you think we could be doing or should be doing to work our way out of it? Um, what, and we, we had HALA a few years ago and adopted a range of reforms that were supposed to help, but I, or do you think those are helping? Do you think we should do additional steps? Um, people looked at single family reform. I mean, I think those things are all really important. And I also think that um, when we're looking at kind of a trickle up effect, it's never going to, um, I mean, frankly, impact the very poorest people because they are just in a different, you know, economic situation than people who are, who have jobs and are earning income from job, from wages. So, um, so while I think like people making 80% of median, you know, certainly and 50% of median even certainly can benefit from you know more housing everywhere and we need to reform our zoning laws and um you know obviously as i said at the outset like i you know i identify very strongly as an urbanist and i think that's part of our our solution for affordable housing but for homelessness i mean what we need to do you know i believe very strongly is um you know is give long-term subsidies to people long-term shallow rent subsidies to people who um you know just can almost afford to live here, but can't, or, you know, or can halfway afford to live here, but, but, but can't quite, you know, make it on the, on $15 an hour or $16 an hour. I think we need to just provide long-term shallow rent subsidies for those folks. We do rapid rehousing, which is, you know, if you actually become homeless, you can get on a list and then eventually you can get an apartment. And then after, you know, six months or so, um, your subsidy runs out and you have to either figure out how to pay for that apartment or you kind of move on to the next thing. So I think that, you know, just fundamentally, that's, a, that's kind of a, a flawed and disproven system. And then I think for people who really have challenges like addiction, like mental illness, um, you know, we need permanent supportive housing that is subsidized forever. Um, and I think and all that stuff is very expensive, but it's also incredibly expensive to be cleaning up trash on the streets all the time. And that is just, you know, we can all agree, I think, that, you know, it's not good to have piles of trash that no one is paying or bothering to pick up, which is the situation we have now. And so if we were to actually take care of that symptom, um, you know, it would cost a lot more than, and, and even just, you know, putting people in shelters or putting people in jail if they're committing minor crimes. I mean, it's such a waste of money um, when the alternative is providing housing. So, um, so yeah, so I think, um, you know, people call it um, social housing um, in other countries, but I think, you know, permanent, something permanent, dignified, and, um, 
you know, and monitored because, you know, a lot of these kind of rapid rehousing situations, they just, they're not, the, the city doesn't do a great job of monitoring to make sure that these are, you know, livable, dignified places for people to live. So I just think we need to put a lot more care into that end and a lot, and then we'll ha we won't have to put so much money into things like shelter, which is what the city is really, really focused on right now, even though they said five years ago, we're not going to do that anymore, you know, but so much for that because people complain about the symptom and then, you know, you have to go throw the bandaid on. So it can be very frustrating to watch over a long period of time because <laughs> you start to see patterns, you know. That brings me back to another um, question. Someone, someone wanted to follow up on one of your stories about the the luxury shower trailers. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> they the got, got of rid the of missing, them. <laughs> the case of the missing like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, they they got rid of them and they got some more reasonably priced ones, which is great. Um, I don't think there are enough and. You know, again, I think if we had like um, public buildings that were open just for restrooms, like Sound Transit's um, uh, Union Station, um, you know, why is that not open for people to use a restroom during the day? So, you know, I think, and, you know, two showers here and two showers across town, which is basically what we have, that's not enough. I mean, that's that's ridiculous and and so um i'm glad they're not spending as much money as they were i mean the the cost has gone way 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 down because they found a local supplier who could actually just build them um one of the things in the budget is um this isn't showers but it's hand washing stations um the council is adding funding for for more hand washing which i also think is like critical and obvious and i'm glad we're doing it but we should have done it ages ago i mean san francisco which is not like you know a paradise um, if you're poor, I mean, they did, they at least have places to wash your hands and so does LA. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so I'm not, I'm not like outraged about the boondoggle anymore, but, um, you know, it's, who knows it's early. Um, so maybe, maybe, um, maybe there'll be something, something else next as this next wave of COVID, uh, crashes on us. <laughs> yes. Uh, so someone in the chat, um, was curious about your take on the new Oregon um, law decriminalizing minor possession of all drugs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that we should decriminalize possession of all drugs. I'm, I'm very, I mean, as a sober person, that might sound like a strange thing to say, but, um, but I'm a huge advocate for harm reduction. And, um, and part of that to me, I mean, decriminalization seems um, absolutely logical. It makes no sense that we're, um, I mean, to me, it makes no sense that drugs are illegal, to be honest, but I mean, we have we have a drug we, that is legal and that everybody uses. We just call it alcohol and we separate it from other drugs, but really it shouldn't be drugs and alcohol. It should just be called drugs. Um, and uh, and so I, I think it's just ridiculous that, you know, that we stigmatize and when we stigmatize, we cause shame. And, you know, when people have shame, they... Um, they use in ways that are more harmful because they're not buying products that are safe. They're not um, using, you know, under supervision of other people who aren't using, which I think is also a really critical thing that, you know, Seattle has been unable to do for, for five years now since the heroin uh, task force recommended it is to get safe injection sites. So I'm, I'm all about decriminalizing and, and reducing stigma and reducing shame. Cause I, I do think that that actually is a, better way to um, to get people healthy. I don't think it leads to, I mean, it might lead to more drug use in the short term. You know, I mean, I think we've seen that with marijuana for sure. Um, but I also, you know, I don't think every drug is, in, I don't think there's any drug that's instantly addictive either. So, um, you know, I, I could go on about my views about drugs forever, but I'll shut up before I start sounding way too out there. <laughs> well, here, I'll, I'll give you another opportunity to talk about uh, that topic. I. I had a roommate who was struggling with um, addiction and she wanted to get clean. And this was in Portland. She had to go line up outside of the one treatment facility at seven in the morning and wait in line and hope to get in. Yeah. Um, it, it was just, you know, horrifying that that is the solution. And where do you think we're at with providing support? That's where we're, at. That's where That's we're exactly at. exactly where we're at. I mean, People, you have to go to the methadone clinic. You can't take it home. Um, there's a secondary market for methadone um, and for Suboxone and other opiates like that um, that are replacements for heroin. And why is there a secondary market? Because drugs are illegal. Um, and so, you know, um, yeah, I mean, 
we don't have enough methadone clinics. Um, we don't, I mean, the whole system, it, it just, just leads you there. It leads you to the point where um, you're having to line up at seven in the morning every single day and it disrupts your life and you can't have a job. And so you continue to use and it's just, you know, it's, it's an awful system that we built. Suboxone is definitely better um, in terms of you just not disrupting your life anymore because methadone you have to take in a liquid form and Suboxone, you know, you can, it's, they're more likely to, they're more willing to give you doses to go home with. Um, and they, they do essentially the same thing, although I think Suboxone's a little milder, but, um, but yeah, I mean, it's, if we didn't, the reason we have that system is because we have this larger system of criminalizing drugs and of stigmatizing drug use and drug addiction, which is a disease. It's not, um, it's not a personality flaw. Excellent. Um, totally changing topics. This is, someone threw a question in the, in the chat. Um, Curious on your take on Amazon not re-signing leases in South Lake Union and the general future of office space since significant telework is likely to continue. Um, I know I've definitely heard people claim the sky is falling and Seattle is doomed and Bellevue is the new Seattle and yada yada. Um, what's, what's your take? <laughs> well, I mean, Bellevue is not, I, I, did, did I miss something? Are they in a bubble that's like exempt from COVID? I mean, the problems that we have here, I mean, yeah, I guess we have different tax systems here, but I mean, first of all, you know, how many people want to live in Bellevue? Um, <laughs> no offense to anybody who lives there. Um, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I don't, I, I, it's, I can't predict, I'm not a futurist. <laughs> So I can't like predict whether the sky is falling in terms of office space. It does, it does feel like um, there is a, um, there's going to be some need for adaptive reuse of a lot of that space though, because, you know, on the one hand, there are like, I know people who go into the office now. I mean, even when the office is basically empty because it makes them feel like their life has structure and meaning and because they're extroverts, they need to get out and be around people and all that stuff. And then there are people that I have been telling, because I've worked from home, you know, for five years, and I love it. And, um, and I've been telling, you know, people how great it is for like all my friends for years and years. And people are like, why would I ever go into the office again? Like, I mean, and I'm talking about government employees, too. I mean, the city of Seattle leases a ton of space. King County leases a ton of space. So I do, I mean, I think there's a reckoning. I don't know if it's a crisis, but I do think we're going to telework a lot more. Um, I don't think offices are doomed, but um, but you know, it's a lot of empty space that we're gonna have to either do something with or, uh, or shut it down. But that's not, I mean, that's, yeah, like I said, that's not unique to Seattle. That's also a problem that is very much, um, you know, existent in Bellevue and maybe even more so. Excellent. Um, we're getting, getting up towards the end of time. So if people have any last questions, they should throw them out there soon. Um, someone asked a question earlier How's your book tour been going? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> so I had a book tour planned. Uh, my book actually came out in July, um, which in, in a way is like is better than if it had come out, I guess, in March or something. Uh -huh. But um, I, had a, I had a book tour. I mean, publishers don't really do book tours unless you're famous. And so mm -hmm. I had a very small book tour plan. But it was like <laughs> New York, Austin, San Francisco, LA, Vancouver, and uh, Portland. And, and of course, Seattle. Didn't get to do any of that. Um, but, you know, it's been, um, on the other hand, there's like, there's appearances, like virtual appearances I've been able to do that I think wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for COVID. Um, I get invited to a lot of conferences and to speak at, you know, it's just things that, you know, would ordinarily be happening in person. And nobody's going to fly me to like Florida or whatever. But, um, you know, but for me to speak virtually, it costs them nothing. And I'm happy to do it, you know, as long as they mention my book and I get to talk about it a little bit. So that's been cool. <laughs> I mean, and I'm also like, I'm an introvert. And like, for, at first, this thing where we're like talking into the camera and looking at the little, you know, eye, so we look like we're making eye contact, even though we're really not, um, was really weird <laughs> for me. And it is still weird. But I've, um, I've done this, I've done it so many times that, um, yeah, I started really enjoying the virtual aspect of it. And I've done so many podcasts and, you know, it's just, I don't know, it's, it's actually ended up great. I think things tend to work out the way that they're supposed to, you know, or if not, you know, 
it's it's best to kind of live your life that way. So, you know, it worked out fine. <laughs> <laughs> good, good, good. It's good to hear. Um, I guess we're almost at the end. So I just want to ask, uh, with your deep knowledge of uh, the ins and outs of Seattle politics and government, what what issues do you think are not getting enough coverage or things do you, you find fascinating but you don't see discussed in the broader media that you wish were? Um, there used to be a, a thing called a county reporter. <laughs> and <laughs> and I mean like a county reporter because since I've lived here, there's a, there was only ever like one. Um, but what what I find, like if I if I could if I had, you know, infinite money and could just throw it away at something that people would not be very interested in, probably I would put it towards a King County reporter because um, they're doing their budget right now. And there's all this stuff going on with, with King County Metro and, you know, with equity and with fair enforcement and access. And, you know, that's just one issue that's interesting to me. But, you know, if I had, if, if there was a county reporter reporting on every aspect of King County, you know, growth, development, land use, criminal justice, um, you know, just the King County Sheriff, like that department, you know, is, has much less accountability than, um, than the city of Seattle does right now as we speak. that are going to try to bring more accountability, including appointing the sheriff. But like, you know, a publication like mine can barely touch on it. And we're really only touching on it because I'm sort of insisting. Um, and um, yeah, so I, I feel like the county is gets such short shrift. And I wish there was, um, I wish there was money to, to hire somebody just to cover the county full time because it's, it's such, I mean, it's not even like an important area. I mean, it's the area that includes Seattle. It is this huge, huge, huge geographic swath with all with 39 cities. You know, I mean, I, I would cover the city of Kent if I could, uh, because just Kent alone, like is, I mean, the stuff they're doing down there is often nuts and their policy towards homelessness is, is horrible. Um, and, uh, but yeah, that's, it's a problem of resources, I guess. And, and the fact that, you know, maybe people just don't, don't care as much. And, you know, Seattle Times cut their county reporter and, and all their bureaus at some point. And I'm sure that was based on some kind of market research. But, um, but yeah, that's, that would be, that would be, that would be like my, my win the lottery passion to just go cover the county. <laughs> <laughs> that is a, a great uh, notion. I think about that sometimes as well. Maybe your, maybe your second hire can be a county reporter. Oh my God. It'd be so, but it would, it would just be a money pit. It would be a total money pit. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Police accountability. Like I would, I would really love to, to double, you know, the, the amount of time my reporter can spend on that. Cause I, I think that is kind of an, an infinite well, but I think, you know, if he could cover King County more, that would be awesome too. Excellent. Um, well, I think we're towards the end. I think we can wrap up there, but um, I want to say thank you so much for joining us and for the work you do. Um, oh, you're welcome. And I'm um, sorry, I do have to answer one question. Um, they are not hand embroidered pillows. They are, uh, I've just, I just got a sewing machine cause like I, I got tired of making bread. <laughs> and, um, and so I started making, pill I started just ordering cloth and making and like sewing pillows, um, pillowcases and buying pillow forms and stuff like that. Um, after I got tired of making uh, masks. <laughs> so next it's gonna be, I think aprons or something. Um, and then I, who knows if the pandemic continues, maybe close. This is the retroactive question of how you've been keeping it together during COVID. <laughs> <laughs> I, the question is whether I've been keeping it together. <laughs> I don't well, know. You know. That's evidence keep for, for yes together. or no. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes. But again, thank you so much. Thanks everyone for coming out. Um, encourage you to support Erica C. Burnett and Publicola and the great coverage she's doing. And they're doing. Thank you. Thanks. Have a great night.